Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. We're going to take a break from the Admiral for a while uh, while I figure out what parts of the tuner are causing the color problem. Seems to be the tuner, but we'll work on that later. Today we're looking at this little 1970s Panasonic 8-track player, model RS801, and this was uh, a purchase at a yard sale. It's been sitting but overall, the faceplate looks good. I'll see if I can degu the price tag and everything like that. But it is, for the most part, unresponsive. So we're going to open this thing up and service it, and we're going to see what it needs. I'm assuming belts, cleaning, and lubrication of all kinds. But uh, we'll figure that out in a little bit. So <clears throat> this is a very simple player, probably just something you could buy as an accessory for your hi-fi. You can see here it's the 801 AUS runs on 120 volts. There's no RCA jacks, they just give you a fixed cable to which you can plug into your stereo and at the other end they have line out left and line out right. Simple, right? So usually the way that you get these out is they're just bolted to the case. So we're gonna go ahead and take this apart and we're gonna see what it needs to get it going. This was uh, probably the earlier generation Mitsushi to drive before they started using plastic parts. At least I hope so, because the ones with the later plastic parts weren't made quite as well. And it's just a matter of getting this out of its box and then we can get a better look at it. So now that I've got that loose, we can slide this out. Remove the case. And so there we are. There's your little preamp up here, which will probably need all new capacitors. These purple Matsushita caps are just awful things. And this is definitely the all metal design, which is very nice. Uh, the way that they achieve the track change is this solenoid fires and pulls on this cam, which is right here. And if I can get my finger around it, we can actuate it and see if it works. Yeah, it gives a tug on that, but the elevator is pretty badly frozen, so it's not going to do much. Underneath, it has a belt, but it's pretty, pretty stuck and frozen. So we're going to need to clean and lube this. This belt might actually work as is. It still feels okay, but the... Uh, the flywheel is very hard to turn. And let's see, here's our eject and load. That still moves. Program selector just fires the solenoid. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this apart. To service the capstan, there's a screw right here that we have to remove. And I'm just going to be whacking the camera mount because it is right in front of me. And it's keyed, so you slide it back and away. Take your belt off. And then this should work its way out. It's going to fight me a little bit because it's sticky. And you see that there's two little ridges. I don't know if you can see those. I think it's a better light on this. So you've got two ridges on the bottom here which interact with the eject mechanism. Those are all moving nicely. So let's get some alcohol and some q-tips and you want to very thoroughly clean the capstan bearings and the capstan for which the tape will run through. This one doesn't look like it has a whole lot of hours on it because there's no shiny spot where the tape has worn on the capstan. 
But you look at the capstan, it looks pretty uniform, other than the dirt and grime that's there that we're cleaning off. If yours has a groove wear in it, uh, you will need to very carefully resurface it. And I'll use 2000 grit. Now, once you do that, unfortunately, sanding it to clean it and resurface it will magnetize it. So you need a method to demagnetize your capstan. You can use a TV degaussin coil, which I doubt many people have. You could use the butt end of a, a uh, soldering gun. You could use uh, a tape eraser, which you can still get on eBay here and there. Anyway, it's got to get demagnetized because otherwise it'll just magnetize the tape that rolls across it and damage it. So, not good. That's a lot cleaner. Let's go ahead and clean our bearing surfaces. We've got one down here. And we've got one up here at the top. And if you want to, you can take a look inside of here. I don't think we're going to be able to see a whole lot. But anyway, you're looking for the surface quality of the bushing in here. Make sure there's no scarring or debris or anything like that. That needs to be clean. That one looks pretty good. So this wasn't run or attempted to run without uh, a working capstan. Nobody forced it. So then what I'll do is I'll take an oiler with some turbine oil like Zoom Spout. And I'll just put a little bit inside of here. Just enough drop or two. And that's just for ease of insertion on the capstan. You'll need to clean the capstan of oil once you get that back in there. So I'm going to put oil here and oil here and insert this back in. It goes in nice and easy now. We can see that that flywheel spins very well. So that's good. Another thing you can do while you've got this apart. I thought about reusing this belt, but as you can see, it's got a, a big hump in it from sitting for so long, and that's going to create wow and flutter problems. Also, a good way to check a belt, if you get up close to it, assuming the camera will focus, I may have to zoom a bit and refocus. Pull on the belt. Stop the camera from shaking here. See all those little micro line fractures in that belt along the edge there? That's no good. That means that this belt will fail and it's a good idea to replace it at this point. Now I know by eyeballing this that that looks like about a 12.6 inch belt that's my fair guess. You can get all sorts of tools, projector belt recorder, yeah, projector recorder belt corporation sold a thing called a measure of belt, which I believe they still sell if you call up Russell Industries who sells belts. They may actually still have these. But it was nice. You could put your belt on there on the measuring point. And as we can see when we measure it, this is about a little this is about a half an inch too high. So if I if I stretch this to taut and it measures 13 inches or just under 13 inches, it really is about 12 and a half or 12.6. So let me grab one of those belts real quick. All right, so if we take a 12.6, which is uh, the closest to the edge of my finger. Actually 12.7. We see that the 12.7 is just a smidge too big. So that will cause slippage and stuff. We don't want that. So we're going to go down to a 12.4 and see what that's like. Okay, so 12.4 is closer, but you can see there's still a little too much in there. So let's try uh, let's try 12.1. Okay. So 12.1 is just a little bit more snug than the original just a little bit so 12.1 it is and if you're curious 
It's an FRZ 12.1. That's the PRB catalog line you can buy from Russell Industries. In fact, their website's on it. Get a good look at that. Call them up. They have good belts. They don't have good belts for everything, but for the mass majority of stuff, they do. So I'm just going to place the belt on here. Verify that that's decent. That motor has good spin. I'm going to leave that alone. Doesn't have any run out either. Now, a note about belts on these machines. The narrower the belt, the faster it will run. So if you use a wide belt, the chances of it going slower are higher because the motor pulley is uh, convex. So the less surface area you have to ride on the larger diameter portion of the convex pulley, the faster it will run. But we really won't know anything until we actually get this thing fired up. So I'm going to go ahead and reinstall the capstan keeper. All right, so that looks nice. Now, because there was oil on the capstan after we installed it, we need to clean it up. And that's accessible down in here. I'm just going to get, again, a Q-tip with some alcohol and clean off the oil residue that I created there. You can also go through the front, too, if you feel you're dexterous enough with a pair of hemostats holding it in here. But I'm just going to rotate the flywheel with my hand from behind as I clean off the capstan. Because if the capstan's oily, the tape will slip and you won't get it to play or it will play erratically. So I'm just moving this back and forth along the capstan as I rotate the flywheel from behind with my hand. You can see a little bit of oil there. Now, uh, let's take a look inside. And let's zoom in. No, not exposure. Let's zoom in and take a look at that head. Nice and shiny. Can't really tell here. Let's see if we can brighten it up some. Yeah, hard to tell. Let's see if we can shove it down in the hole. Pretty good looking head, no gap, no wear marks on it. This is definitely a very low hour set. So that may or may not be good. Uh, all right. For some reason, the elevator decided to free up. Not sure what I did there. Okay. Now it's hard to point out where the elevator service point is just zoom out a little bit here. Um, see that spring down in there? That's your elevator shaft. That was, well, it's starting to get sticky the more I mess with it. Uh, so I'm going to take my oiler and put a couple drops of oil on the elevator shaft here and just work it up and down until it frees itself. seems pretty happy. This cam up here is already free rotating. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we'll look at is the track display light, which is this guy here. And he's basically a set of rotating contacts and they then control the lamps up front here. And this gets oxidized so that way you can't see what track you're on. So we'll put a little bit of contact cleaner in there. And then we'll see if I can get my fat fingers in here with a tool and work the solenoid. And we're just, that's just cleaning the switch. And I don't know if you can tell, when I move the solenoid, you can 
perhaps see that the head moves up and down. I'll get a better shot of that in a little bit. I'm just going to finish cleaning this. Okay, so watch the head. This is the head. Watch as I move the solenoid. You can see it go down, come back up, come back up, etc. Uh, because there's eight tracks, four programs of two tracks each, stereo and all that sort of thing. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is plug this thing in and we're going to see if the transport will run on its own and if there's any scary noises or misbehaviors. And without a cartridge, which I'm not going to insert just yet, there's usually a switch. And I think the switch is a pin located back there. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. It's at the very back here. But if I push on this... It locks it into place. And then eject. Let's see. Yeah, I'm trying to fool it into thinking there's a tape in there, but here the switch is over here. Let's try this. The light comes on. You can see the little track light indicator come on there. All right, switching tracks, that's good, but no motor movement. Okay, so that switch is engaged, seeing there's a tape inside. There we go. Now I can hear the motor running. We can see the flywheel turning pretty quiet. So both switches have to be closed in order for that to happen. Alright, cool. So, now we know that the motor runs, and quite well actually, it's very quiet. This uses an old-fashioned make-and-break governor inside. It's not electronic. I don't know if you can hear the chatter of the governor, but that's supposed to what that's supposed to maintain the speed. Got a little bit of belt quiver here. Not bad. Piece of tape fell out of here. Okay. Uh, there's also the little butterfly sensor back there. Make sure that's clean too. You'll probably need to get back there with a set of hemostats and a Q-tip. That just rolls over a piece of foil on the tape to tell it to change tracks. It usually makes the circuit for the solenoid. In fact, uh, I can demonstrate that by... We'll turn on the uh, motor and I'll touch these two points together. And you can hear it change the track. So that's me emulating the foil. Okay, and I know everybody likes to uh, comment about the Billy Joel 8 track that I have up there. So we're going to play a short snippet of that just to make sure that it's working. But I ain't going to play it for very long because I'm pretty certain it's in the copyright database. Give me a, just a second here. Hook this up to a real amp. And we'll see if the audio is capable of working. Because we still may have to address all those funky old capacitors in there. There's level controls. Or they may be EQ controls, not sure. Alright, so... Appropriate input. Let's give it a go.
All right, so one thing that we notice is that when we change tracks, a significant voltage loss occurs to the motor because you can hear the speed come back up. So we need to address that. That's a power supply thing. Very likely we've got a capacitor that's dying. Yeah, this is to blame. Very likely we have this here. Uh, we've also got an obnoxious phone call two hours before we open. So let's see here. Yeah, so this is a buffer capacitor for the motor, which is getting kind of warm. It's interesting. All right, let me get the phone. Okay, so I've got a meter hooked up across the motor, and you can see with no load, we start out with 13.5. As soon as I press that button, it drops to 8. Look at that. That's pretty significant. That's a 5 volt loss. Now, if we look at the AC, right now we got a volt of AC riding on 13 volts. That's almost 10%. Now, if I hit the solenoid, it spikes to 2.7. Two point six three. Yeah, so and then it spikes to four twenty there if I load or unload, but that's not probably significant enough. So very likely we've got an opening filter capacitor. And I suspect this guy here because he is getting kind of warm shouldn't be warm at all so let's yank that and then also let's measure the uh, main filter across the across that there uh, amplifier that's the word I'm looking for the little pre-amplifier okay so I'm gonna grab a 470 microfarad and we're going to swap out the one back here for the motor, see if that makes an improvement. My money, though, is probably on the main filter that cleans up everything. All right, so I just replaced that little 470 microfarad. We're going to give the voltage check again. But again, my money is very likely on the main filter. So let me hook my meter back up. right all right so we're at 14 now still drops to 9 so still a 5 volt drop which is too significant so let's go for that main filter all right I actually had an Axial 3300 uh, in inventory. I just hooked it and soldered it in. The old one was a 2200, so a little bit better than stock, but probably not significant enough to mean anything. So now let's do our voltage check again. Let's see how, if that has changed anything. I suspect it will have. All right, so let's fire up here. It's a four volt drop now. I guess that solenoid just draws more current than that poor uh, power supply transformer can provide. If I hold it down, it's still a 5-volt drop. 
So the capacitors aren't it. Maybe it's just a poor design. Let's shove the cartridge in again. Yep, so quick change doesn't really hurt it all that much. But I notice initially it is a little slow to start, which I'm not really too keen on. So it may be that uh, this is a little bit too snug. So maybe we do need to go back to the 12.4. still have that nearby so let's just go ahead and do the 12.4 and see how much better that behaves a little bit of slip but definitely less loading on the motor it may be that there's additional current draw that's occurring because of the load on the motor and that's already taxing the power supply and when you add the solenoid into it, it just pisses it off. So let's see what it looks like with the 12.4 belt on. Maybe there's just supposed to be a tiny little bit of slip here. Let's see how it behaves. Let me hook up my meter again. Slap our cartridge in. It's better. Still a little bit of a uh, drag there, but significantly better than before. So I'm guessing this is just kind of a cheapy. So. Yeah, that's just kind of how the transport is. It's not a top dollar one. It doesn't have a fully regulated power supply. I suppose I could make one for it, but that would probably require a bigger transformer because that's just a wimpy little thing. This was just a get it done type thing. So um, I'm going to do one last thing and just check whether these are levels or EQs. I'm hoping they're EQs because the sound is just kind of, well, it's typical 8-track sound. It's not that great. There were only a few brands that made really good 8-tracks. Magnavox was one, but I also think Magnavox used a Matsushita drive like this, but with their own electronics. So let me do a quick tweak, chest, uh, tweak test and see what these pots do. I'm betting they're level pots. Yeah, they are in fact just uh, level pots. So, But it's turning at the right speed for the most part, maybe about a half a percent slow. And I could go through and recap this thing, but it really just, I don't think it's worth it. Maybe I'll leave that up to the next person. They just wanted it to work. Let's see, make sure nothing, that looked like it's shorting out, but that's a piece of phenolic, so no biggie. Yeah, that's okay. All right, let's, uh, reassemble this thing and clean it up. Okay, so now what we need to do is get rid of this awful price tag stick'em stuff without marring the face or anything like that. And that's really what Goo Gone's for. So let me get some of that in a toothbrush and we'll get this stuff soaking. Found that Goo Gone works pretty well. And you just need to saturate it. breaks down the adhesive. It's kind of like a super surfactant and just makes it really slippery and so much so that the glue doesn't want to stick anymore. You can actually use this for cleaning too if you want to. We can go over this and get this stuff wet and cleaned up and wipe it all away. Be surprised at how well it does at cleaning up garbage. So why not? Let's just go to town on it.
Okay. Let it sit a little bit. And let me go get a very fine razor so that we can get this top thing off real quick here and then we'll work on non-metallic stuff for the face. Alright, so I'm just going to very carefully See how that's just lifting right up? A couple of spots here that are crummy. That came off nice. A little bit of sticky goo at the end here. And let's see if I can get this up with my fingernail. Yeah, it's working. You don't want to use anything metallic on the faceplate because it's soft aluminum and you will mar the crap out of it. So, just use your fingernails or use something like a lemon wood stick, popsicle stick, chopstick, something that's not going to destroy the face. Just takes patience. Need to get a little more goo gone on it. Break up the adhesive a little bit more. some ASMR noises for you. Starting to look nice now. finish it off by getting the remaining adhesives off. Use some more Goo Gone and a toothbrush. And now that we've busted the top stuff away, we can really get down in here, clean this. See these little spots here that are left? They're coming off now. Much better. Okay, let's grab a shop towel and wipe it all down. Okay, now it's true that the Goo Gone does leave a little bit of a residue, so if that bothers you, or if the smell bothers you too, it does have a little bit of a, a harsh citrusy smell. You can grab the Windex and clean off the remaining residue that's on here. Looking pretty good now. I think this thing's ready to go. 
Now, there are some people that are going to say, well, if you recapped it, it would sound like new again. But in reality, that's not always true. Uh, eight tracks are not terribly well constructed. They vary enormously from cartridge to cartridge as far as the recording quality. And people could have played these hundreds and hundreds of times and just wore them out. So without having a fresh reference, which I really don't have, there's no way to tell whether the, the slight loss of high frequency is due to the player or whether it's due to the media. So I could try a couple of other tapes. I have several other tapes here. So let's see. How's this sound? At least we know the track change works. See, that sounds a little better than the Billy Joel tape. Let's see what our ACDC one sounds like. Even better. So, like I said, some grease. That one sounds like crap. And these are ones that I have replaced the uh, uh, the pressure pads on. So, like here's the Commodores. I mean, it just doesn't. It varies so enormously. So you can't really tell uh, who's who uh, or who's going to be good and who's not. Like that sounds okay. So, yeah. Eight tracks vary so much in their quality and usage, you don't know how many times they've been played. So, you can't always blame the player for that. Depending on the tape, this actually sounds really good. So, and all, of course, all my cartridges are dusty. But, anyways, uh, this thing's good to go. You may see this up for adoption on e screw or something like that. Uh, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video. More stuff to come.